nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Kelly. Ms. Betterman? Here. Mr. Case Lyle? Absent. <coughs> Ms. Flynn? He may show up late. Here. I didn't get a notification. Okay. Mr. Rutkowski? Here. Ms. Dadler? Here. Mr. Sang? Here. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Here. Here. Mr. White. Here. Fire exits, Dr. Lando? Exits are in the back of the LGI. All right. The first workshop we have tonight is uh, from Mr. Ron Mackety, Supervisor of Transportation. He'll be going over the transportation budget, uh, budget presentation. Transportation Department for our numbers for next year. Uh, and I'm kind of going with a navigation theme. If you look at the slides, you'll see uh, first uh, section is where we are, with a little, that little uh, where we've been, uh, where we're going, and how do we get there. So when we talk about where we are as a department, we're going to be talking about turn services that we provide, schools that we provide to, and for the most part, uh, the resources that we have in our department, the vehicle resources and the human resources. Okay, the first thing I wanted to talk about is what services is the district obligated to provide? Uh, obviously, uh, when you think about transportation, we talk about students going to school, coming home. So at morning AM and PM transportation for eligible students. Uh, we have an eligibility uh, mileage limitation in the district, so we transport those students who are eligible. Uh, we are also uh, obligated to provide transportation for students attending private schools up to 15 miles. Uh, we do special education transportation typically up to 50 miles one way. Uh, students who are receiving transportation services under McKinney Bento, uh, transportation as a related service if it's necessary for a student to receive services in another building. And we also do extended school year services for our students with disabilities. So our department is actually working pretty much year round. There's really only about three weeks out of the year that we're not actively providing transportation services. Some of the services that we also provide, uh, we do late buses. We have midday home-based instruction students that are receiving services. Um, we do after-school transportation for students attending the elementary IRP programs. Uh, last year we did 151 IRP trips, uh, field trips, and again in 2017-18 we did 231 field trips, sports trips, 344 sports trips last year, and the work program for those students that um, are in uh, certain classes that go out into the community work um, Just a, just a uh, comment, uh, there's a number of acronyms throughout, so if you, uh, when you come to them, just state what they are, like okay. you did for the home-based instruction, that was helpful, and then IRP, and then so on. IRP is the Intermediate Reading Program? Yeah. I'm going to ask Eric. Instructional Reinforcement. Instructional Reinforcement Program. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I'm trying to... Uh, yeah, it'd just be helpful to, to feel free to call me out on those. Okay. Okay. So some of the schools that we go to, and I didn't list all the schools. I just kind of summarized it. We have in uh, six district schools that we transport to. So the way these numbers are set up, if you look at the bottom, um, the first number is the number of schools that we are providing services to. The second number is the total number of schools that we have students going to. The third number may include schools that we have contracted out. 
and the fourth number would be schools that are not serviced. So if you look in Beacon, we have six schools, our high school, middle school, four elementaries, and we provide transportation services to all of those. Uh, we currently have students en enrolled in 20 private schools. We transport students to six of those. Uh, four of them are outside the 15 mile distance, so we do not provide transportation for those students. So it's six, 16 you said, for we provide to 16, and yes. then four not. Okay. Uh, special education sites, we have students enrolled in 33 different special ed programs. We are transporting to 26 of those. Uh, we have five of those that are contracted out through our Duchess BOCES Transportation Cooperative Program. And we have two students who will receive residential services that um, we can provide services to, but they haven't requested it. So in total, we have students enrolled in 59 schools, 48 of which we're providing transportation services to, five that are contracted out, and six that we are not providing services to. So our resources that we have in the district, vehicles, our human resources, our staff, and our physical plant, these are all important resources. I just wanted to touch on them really quickly. Right now we have 30 buses, 26, when I say vans, I refer to the small 20 passenger school buses. They're not particularly van, like uh, your minivan or your 40 common line. They are um, the small uh, capacity school buses. They have up to like 12 or 20 students in them. Um, and we have 10 cars that belong to the district. Is the um, 30, we've had, we had as many as 36 in the past, right? Remember the number of 36 or so? For full-size buses, I mean. I'd have to check. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that um, I told Lisa. I didn't tell her. Let's go back to the slide. Good job. Uh, 66. So we've had as as much as like 68 vehicles total. Right, but I just was talking about the full-size buses. I remember. I think it was 36 in the past. So. Well, yeah, we can discuss that a little bit as we go on. Okay. Our human resources. Uh, right now, um, I'm going to say 45 drivers. I had one pass the road test on Friday, but I did two resignations today. So that number <laughs> never really slots anywhere. So um, we have 45 drivers, six sub drivers, uh, 29 bus monitors, one sub monitor, two dispatchers, two head bus drivers, one head mechanic, two out of three mechanic positions filled, and one supervisor. I wanted to kind of lay this out over the past couple of years um, since I've been here so that you can kind of see where we were. So if you look back in the 2012-13, in the 2012-14, we had more drivers at that point, um, and things were a little bit more comfortable. Um, right now we're down a few in our numbers, and one of the other items over here, if you notice over here in the lower right hand corner, under our clerical staff, we went a whole year without having any clerical support. So a lot of the typical duties that our clerical person would do would be kind of divvied up amongst those of us that were doing them. Um, so that's just kind of give you a summary of what we've had in the past. Is there a reason why that position isn't filled? Uh, there were some big shoes to fill. Uh, we had someone in there who was very talented, and we were spent a lot of time trying to find the right person to fill those shoes. And is it filled? It is currently filled. Okay, just to touch on a few things of where we've been, uh, I wanted to talk a couple of things over the last eight years or so. When I got here, uh, we had our elementary bus routes at that time, Glenham was the only school that had their own set of buses. Um, that presented some issues um, because uh, the buses that were doing the other elementaries, Barstow, South Avenue, Sargent, they would pick kids, uh, pick students up from all different areas of the district and then drop them off at each school. And at the end of the day, they would have to go to each school and pick the students up and then drop them off. Um, some of the challenges involved in that was the amount of time it took to get into each school in the morning. You may have been the first boss here. So we were having times by the time they got to the third school, students were getting late to school. Uh, 
Um, the other part of the issue, and I think maybe some of our administrators can attest to, uh, when you have students from more than one school on a bus, when you have disciplinary issues, it gets a little more complicated. So we started to try and separate the buses out. So in 2012-13, we were able to pull buses out from Farstall. So we had Glenn and Farstall had their own buses, and South Avenue and Sargent continued to share. And then in 2015-16, uh, we started to pull some buses out of South Avenue and Sargent. We still had two buses that shared, and as of 2016-17, each of the elementaries had their own set of buses. Uh, we still have some cross coverage when we get into our um, special needs vans, but for the most part, uh, this I think is a huge improvement. Uh, definitely appreciated more by the administrators. Uh, some of the challenges we had this past year. There have been some changes in the DMV road test procedures that went into place last March 1st, so it's almost a year that those procedures have been in, chain, um, in place. We had a DMV audit in June of 2018. Uh, in August, our facility was struck by lightning. Uh, we had some new schools. We've had to contract out some routes because we haven't had the manpower and uh, resources to fill that. We've had a significant increase in McKinney Vento services. And uh, is everyone familiar with McKenny Vento? Uh, we have a lot of new board members, and it would be helpful, I think, to explain. Okay. Uh, McKenny Vento, when students are displaced for one reason or another, whether they lose their housing or um, for some reason they are uh, no longer living at home, they may be an emancipated youth, um, they can live uh, with another person, or McKinney Vento basically means a student is living in a situation that's not fixed, regular, and adequate. Um, in a nutshell, um, basically they don't have a regular place to stay. They're living with someone else, or they're living in a motel or doing something. So we've had a lot of changes in that. I'm gonna talk a little bit as to why we see some of those changes. Um, one of the other uh, challenges we've had, I showed you the numbers a little while ago, driver shortage, which is a nationwide type of thing. And some of the DOT inspections and vehicle registrations, there's been some changes that DMV has enacted. That, I'm sorry, that DOT has enacted. To a clarification on McKinney Vento, isn't it that those those students may be living in different areas, which might, but they're not, they're not, they don't have to change schools all the time whenever they move around, and that's the, that's the key, right? We have to yeah. them up. Well, we have, we have students are, them that are living in receiving services under McKinney Vento that are living here in the district, but we also have a number of students that are receiving services that are residing outside the district. Right. And, you know, the McKinney Vento is a whole nother presentation, that I'm sure. I think as it relates to transportation, it's, it, it's the creating the least disruption possible for the student. It's so there's designed continuity to, to, in to allow, allow the student to continue in their right. same environment that they've been in, in an educational setting. Okay, so the DMV change, the DMV uh, things we've been through in the last year. New procedures required of school bus drivers. Things that they had to do that most of us didn't have to do when we took our road tests. Um, we all had to parallel park as part of our basic skills test. Now they're asking bus drivers to do things like offset alley backing, uh, which is basically instead of backing straight into a spot, you start over here and then you have to back into another spot. Um, so there's uh, skill changes that have happened. There have been things uh, that are being stressed, and these changes are coming down from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. They are telling all of the states what they have to do when they're licensing people. Okay, so that's been a, a statewide challenge, and at one point, there was about 70% of the people going for CDLs that were failing their road tests. These were not bad drivers, they just, hadn't adapted, the trainers hadn't adapted to the new procedures that they were being asked to do. So that's a high percentage. Um, and that leads a little bit into our driver shortage, and I'll get into that. Um, we had our um, changes in our audit procedures. I'm gonna talk a little bit later on about what we're audited on. But we had a, what they, when I see T and I unit, that's our testing and investigations unit. Each area of DMV has a, what's called a testing and investigation unit. And the local TNI unit for this area was located in the West Havistro office. And typically when we would get audited, we'd have to either take all of our driver files, 
box them up and ship them down to West Cabbage Door, or they would send an examiner's, a team of examiners, up to our location and we'd have to provide a workspace for them to go through and look for our driver files. So we were, we got it on it in June of 2018. Um, busy time for field trips, busy time for regions, busy time. So the way they changed the procedures where they no longer had a T&I unit, they had a, a statewide unit that was based out of Albany and instead of sending someone to you or having you send your file somewhere, they asked you to scan all of your documents to that centralized unit, set, attach them as emails, and then forward them to DMV. So it was very labor intensive on our part. It was a little bit disruptive to our typical June processes that we're going through. But uh, we did have that audit. It was a new procedure. And uh, in that audit, we did not have any deficiencies. But uh, in the past, when we've had audits, and we get audited like every three years, um, they would come, the team would come, and then you would have an exit interview, and they'd talk about what they found in the files, any deficiencies, anything you needed to do to correct them, and you had a, a, a big, long report. This past audit, we got an email that said, thank you for your audit, you're in compliance, and I kept looking for, and that was it. So um, they were happy with what they saw. Our lightning strike on August 14th of 2018, I don't remember the exact time, but uh, essentially what happened was lightning struck somewhere in our, our bus garage facility. It knocked out our security alarm system for the bus depot. It knocked out seven out of 10 garage doors in the parking garage that we could not open or close. Um, the most significant piece was our OMTEC automatic tank gauge was damaged and eventually had to be replaced. And our fuel master program was disabled. So when we start to get into things like the automatic tank gauge, which uh, maintains the inventory on our uh, petroleum bulk storage, that's what PBS stands for, transportation. PBS, petroleum bulk storage. Um, we have to maintain our inventory within a certain percentage, otherwise it's seen as a potential leak. And I kind of, I've talked about that in the past. As you have a tank that's underground, each, as you go down, each measurement, each inch of volume has a different coefficient, ratio, um, and it's all programmed into this automatic tank gauge. So the tank gauge measures how much fuel is in that tank, and it tells you it's one way of knowing whether you have a leak or not. So without getting too much into the DEC rates that we have to comply with, with our tank gauge being damaged, we had to go out with the big old ruler the old fashioned way and open up the tanks and stick them in and take manual readings. And our fuel master program was disabled. So we weren't able to track the fuel that was being put into our vehicles. We have a fuel master system, which basically runs with each, each vehicle has a fob on the key ring. When you insert the fob, it tells us which vehicle is being fueled, how much is put into that fuel, and each driver has a corresponding pin number. So it tells you who, did, who fueled what vehicle at exactly what time, exactly how much fuel they put in. So we had to do some manual paper and pencil um, things to keep track of that. So that was kind of a little bit of disruption two weeks before school started. Um, so essentially the damages we incurred as a result of this lightning strike were in excess of $14,000. We had these alternate procedures, which I just described. And we weren't able to get all of the repairs completed until November 8th. So it involved a couple of things. It involved the, uh, the alarm system company, it involved the garage door company, it involved our vendors, our, our petroleum bulk, our PBS petroleum bulk storage vendors. Um, so it took us quite a while to get this straightened out. Uh, new schools. So we have a few new schools that came in this year that um, some of them were new, some of them were schools we used to transport to that we didn't for the last few years and now we were again. Um, but about five or six new schools. And whenever we get a new school, one of the things we have to translate is, um, and, and a lot of times this comes from students being placed by our pupil services department, our pupil personnel services department, our PPS department. And we really never know when we're gonna get those placements. They don't happen always in the beginning of the year. They happen throughout the year, right? And so we, we never really can anticipate them. 
So when we get these new placements, we have to take into a couple of things. What, what, where is that school located? Is it in the district? Is it outside the district? Is it near any other schools that we're already transporting to? Do the bell times work? Are they close enough where we can combine schools together and get students there uh, efficiently? Or is it the bell times too far apart where if we put these kids on the bus, one of them's gonna be sitting on the bus 45 minutes waiting for school to start? So these are all logistical challenges that we have to do every time uh, we receive new students. Um, so some of the other things you look at, do a neighboring school districts have students going there? Um, I referenced the Duchess BOCES Cooperative Transportation Program earlier. So that's a program that's run through Duchess BOCES where we have a contractor who um, certain schools, we may have one student that goes to that school. Wappingers may have a student that goes to that school. There may be a student from another district that goes to that school. So this is a, um, an efficient way of making sure that we're using our resources to get students to school. Okay, some of the changes in, and I said MV, I'm referring to McKinney Bento Transportation. And I went back two years. In 2016-17, we had 17 students receiving McKinney Bento Transportation services that were located out of the district. Uh, we did 11,000 miles that year, and it cost us $46,000 to do that. In 2017-18, last year, we had 36 students that received uh, out of district McKinney Bento transportation. Our mileage essentially doubled, and our costs went up 100 to 112 thousand uh, dollars. This year to date, we have I want to say 39, but we got three new students today. So um, as of, and this is as of. December, uh, February 25th, when I put these numbers together, we had spent $109,000, uh, and we're looking at 26,000 miles at that point. So essentially halfway through the school year is what we're looking at. So on the logistical end, it's not necessarily the amount of miles or the costs that are the challenge, but the allocation of resources, finding drivers, finding vehicles um, to meet the needs of students in far-reaching places. The other thing that has an, had an impact on this were the changes in ESSA, which allow students to continue to receive transportation services after finding permanent housing. So if we had a student that lived in, let's say, um, across the river in Orange County somewhere, and they were living with a relative, and then they found permanent housing in that town, under the old regulations, we no longer had to provide transportation for that student, but they could continue to come to school here at Beacon. With the changes in ESSA, we now have to continue to provide transportation for that student for the remainder of the school year. And if it's their second to last year in the building, if they only have their uh, like a rombout seventh grader and they have one more year in that building, or a junior here at the high school and they have one more year, we, we may also have to provide transportation for the entire next school year. So these are some of the reasons you see these numbers growing. Um, the other uh, thing is if you look at the cost of housing in Beacon, what's happening is we have students who are being displaced and they're not able to find affordable housing back here in Beacon. So these are some of the things that are, that are going on. And I think when I ran the numbers, that 39 was about 1.8% of the total number of students that we transport. Um, for some reason, we tend to have an abnormally high number of students in this category. Um, and I went to a statewide workshop three weeks ago, and people were kind of amazed that we had that many students in our particular student population. Students that this that are receiving, because this combines special ed out of district placement along with... Mm, not, no. This no, these are students for the most part in our public schools who are living outside of the, the, the district boundaries coming back to Beacon for educational services in our high school, middle school, and our elementary Because they lost housing previously in Beacon. Yes. Can you tell me where most of them have gone to? Mm, without without being too over. specific. It's all over. Yeah, it's all over the year. In Poughkeepsie. Hopeway, Hopewell, Middletown, um, Newburgh. Uh, so we're going 
multiple different directions. How long do we have to continue to provide those services? What does the law require on that? Well, there's really, that, that's the catch. There's really no uh, limitation on the amount of time that a student can be homeless. So we, some of these students, I'm sorry, some of these students have been displaced for a number of years. Are there, are there costs associated with this? Are these aidable? They are aidable. Yeah. Well, if they're included in the transportation, they're aidable. Right. Um, we have set aside money in one of our title grants for homeless, but not anywhere near the money that he's spending for transportation. So and we, we try to use those costs for um, student need. You know, we try not to use them for the transportation piece, but if a child um, that's displaced needs some um, personal things or, or some other help that way, we use that money for that. So this is not, we don't get a direct refund from the state? Not for this, no. This is part of our transportation budget. So it looks like it's doubled and then continued, the trend line has continued up a smaller increment. Um, is there a way to, to break down, like, is this, I mean, just in your knowledge, was it consistent with 17 or below, or consistent, like, your, these numbers go to 2016? Well, again, the laws in essence changed, I think, two years ago. So did that have the most direct impact? Yeah. So you, you see these numbers creeping up. Again, essentially, if, if I was displaced and I was living in Orange County and I found an apartment there, once I found that apartment, I could continue to come back to Beacon, but I would no longer be eligible for transportation services. Right. With the Every Student Succeeds Act, that changed, the legislation changed, so now those students are eligible to continue receiving transportation services once they find permanent housing for the rest of the school year and an entire year. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I understood so. that part. I, I should be more precise in my question. I guess what I'm wondering is, it sounds like that policy was probably designed to capture unusual circumstances, but it seems like, cause, because you also said that among your colleagues, they were surprised by this number. So it sounds like this policy has uniquely sort of collided with the situation in Beacon? I would, I would say to some extent, to, just to, as an aside, um, I belong to a, uh, the New York Association for People of Transportation, and I'm actually president of the local chapter, which comprises Ulster and Dutchess counties. So we put out a survey there, and there were, um, there was one or two schools that had like 50 kids or 40 kids, but they were much larger districts than us. So. The other piece is we are in the lower part of Dutchess County, so we don't have a lot of private schools here in Beacon, whereas a lot of our schools, a lot of times what we'll do to make this less of an impact is we will try to pick up these students, if they're elementary students, we can pick them up on our private schools that are dead heading back. We do a lot of that because it's, if that bus is in Poughkeepsie, dropping off at eight o'clock and we have students that need to be in Beacon by nine o'clock, it doesn't oh, okay. make sense to yeah. send an empty bus. So we, we, are, we work really, really hard to try and maximize our resources. So when you saw the numbers on the cars before, and I said we had 10 cars, this is one of the things we used to use the cars for in that we, um, we were able to use cars to get students who were receiving this type of service. But now there's so many of them that it's not uncommon for us to have a half a dozen kids picked up in Poughkeepsie and transported back here to Beacon, mm -hmm. and three or four kids out west in Polk Grange or wherever. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So let me move on a little from here. Okay, so then uh, one of the documents we shared online was the um, yellow buses, red flags, New York school bus driver shortage. Uh, this was a survey that was done by the New York Association for People's Transportation in conjunction with the New York School Boards Association and the National Association for Pupil Transportation. They did a survey of 200 New York transportation directors and some of the results, I mean, this is like a 30 page um, study, but um, some of the results they had were that of those 200 um, districts, 74% 70, of those districts had unfilled driver vacancies in 2017 uh, 27 of those had 11 to 20% unfilled driver 
vacancies. 60% of those 200 directors said that the shortage is their number one concern. 70% describe the problem as significantly worse or somewhat worse. So this is our challenge is in finding people who are who want to be school bus drivers. Now, I talked a little bit before about the changes in the DMV testing procedures. Okay. We're going to touch a little bit on what the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is going to be making us do next. But before we did that, I wanted to give a shameless plug, put in a commercial break here. Um, so if there are people out there who are interested in being school bus drivers, they can click on this little link and it will take you to a little quick Google form that you can fill out online. I don't know why it's going to my Citrix server. But if you go to the district web page, there's a link that people can fill out and just leave a few things, their name, their phone number, have they had any experience or whatnot, and then I follow up by sending those folks applications. So. We also post uh, and advertise? We do. Mm -hmm. We, we, uh, we uh, Anne-Marie and Matt and I met uh, a few weeks ago and we discussed some more strategies that we were going to be looking to implement. We're going to add, um, add uh, the information to district social media and kind of repeat that um, just to use a, a different mode of trying to reach out so we'll get started on that yes because a lot Let's of people see. get their information from Facebook was the um, the survey did the, were the trends similar as far as if, I understand that the shortage was uniform but were the causes sort of standard I know that it's a, a tight labor market in the sense of it is and, and rather than to get too much into it, I did include that um, survey there if you want to look through it. Um, some of the things that we, um, we went through a uh, winter workshop last last month with NIAP, uh, which is the New York Association of like close to 280 people from across the state participating. And one of the things they had was a roundtable discussion on school bus driver recruitment. Um, there's some neat challenges to it. Um, and, and you've heard me talk about this in the past. If you look at the public's perception of school bus drivers, okay, it's not always a rosy one. Okay, um, you know, if you go in, if you go into the high school tomorrow, into the auditorium full of seniors, and ask them how many people want to be school bus drivers when they grow up, you're not going to see a whole lot of names go, hands go up. Okay, same thing if you go to a NIAP conference and you say how many of you thought you were going to be transportation directors when you were a kid, you don't see a whole lot of hands go up. So. <laughs> Transportation isn't something that people kind of plan to go into. It's you, you travel down a path and you find yourself doing this. And you have everyone in there from your typical um, mom who wants to be home the same time with her kids to we have people who are retired um, from the MTA, from the sanitation department in New York City, uh, from Verizon, from um, the police department. We, we, we get a whole bunch of folks. A lot of the retirees though aren't really coming in. I mean, there's, there's a whole, you know, and we, we discuss strategy in our meeting about, you know, what some of the issues are. Um, but the thing is, you know, we need to recruit drivers. We need to train drivers. Okay? And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and where we're going. Okay? Here are some of the challenges in becoming a driver. Being a school bus driver isn't just getting your license and driving a school bus, hopping in the bus and driving a school bus. There are a number of different agencies that you have to comply with. So when we talk about those agencies in here, becoming a driver, you have the DMV licensing process, which is your testing and investigations unit, the ones who give you the written test and give you the road test. Then we have the DMV BDU, which is the bus driver unit. They monitor every bus driver, school bus driver, or otherwise bus driver in the state of New York. And there's a whole set of driver qualifications that they have to monitor, and that's the stuff that we get audited on. Then you have the New York State Education Department that has um, initial and ongoing qualifications or requalifications for drivers. And then you have the Federal Water Carrier Safety Administration, which is now um, mandating your federal licensing requirements and the Department of Transportation Drug and Alcohol requirements. So real quick to talk about what some of these things are. The licensing process, so this is gonna change December 7th, 2020. That's less than a year from now. 
license. So it's very much as if you were going for your driver's license. So it's December or February? Oh, I'm sorry, February. February, okay. February 7th, 2020. It is close. So it's very much reflects the process you had, you went through when you were 16. You get your permit, you study the book, you pass the written test, you get your permit, someone trains you for your road test, and when you feel you're ready, you can sign up and take a road test. That has been the process pretty much up until this point. So we have folks that are trainers, they train, we had people train. Now this isn't the road test requirements, this is the licensing process. So. MAP 21, which is the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century Act, uh, is going to change that process a little bit. So what's going to happen now is you have someone who says, I want to be a bus driver, they express an interest. The driver trainer prepares the applicant for the CDL written test. You have to pass the written test. Uh, we currently do a written permit class test uh, several times throughout the year. We have the entire CDL manual on PowerPoint. We take them out to the shop. We show them the things that the drawings don't show them in the book. But they have to do this, they have to prepare for a written test. Then that applicant takes and passes that written test. Then this is where the changes start to happen. Um, that applicant now has to receive classroom and behind the wheel, BTW, behind the wheel training from a registered training provider. There is going to be a TPR or a training provider registry nationally through, um, throughout the country that anyone who wants to train CDL drivers has to apply for and become uh, listed on that training provider registry. Okay? Uh, the applicant obtains additional credentials through the class. They complete the full training from the training provider. Then that training provider is going to send electronic notification that applicant has passed the material with an 80% percentage rate. And it's at that point that the applicant can then apply to take a road test. So there's a few more hoops in here that CDL drivers, school bus drivers, are going to have to start jumping through to get licensed within the next year. Are current drivers grandfathered in? This is just the licensing process. So if you already have your license, you don't need to go okay. through. So how long does this process take? <laughs> That's a good question. We don't know. <laughs> we haven't done it yet. How long does it take before this, the change? I would say, depending on the applicant and what their typical driving skills are, um, anywhere from three months to four and a half months. Um, so you know, we have some, we have people that have done it in a month and a half. Okay, um, but to do it right and to make sure, um, we train from the school bus industry, so we tend to try and. Um, provide what they're going to need to transport our students. Uh, so now, what's essentially what we have to do as a school district now is we have to apply to be on that training provider registry and meet a certain curriculum that was set forth by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Um, so, at what point in this process would a driver that we hire actually get hired and get start getting paid? Once they pass their CDL. So the, the, the last block. Last well, they're not, yeah, the last block. <coughs> so it's a three-month um, investment without pay. Yeah, right. right. Yes. It's, it's, a pre, it's a pretty good investment. Now, I can tell you one of the strategies that, that we use and that other districts and private carriers use is if we find somebody and we think, you're going to be a good employee, we have to get you, you know, uh, on board. If we have monitor vacancies, we can hire that person as a bus monitor and see how they do. This way, we already know, are they going to come to work every day? Are they going to be good with kids? Are they going to, you know? It was a thing I saw in the paper the other day. It was, it was a joke that, you know, we, they want you to come to work every day. They don't want you to have to go to court too much, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, this is the third time your grandmother has died. Um, so. We, we, did, we need people, this kind of gives us an idea of what type of employee the person is. And the last person, the last two people that passed the road test had started as bus monitors. So, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, been a, a pretty effective strategy for us. And uh, presumably the, when you apply for that CDL, right, the whatever you have to submit as your training to the state? Yes. 
Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Map 21 and what the process is going to be. Oh, I think you just do that. Okay, what we're, what we're looking to do. That's in the how we get there section. So, there, there's so much here that I'm trying to throw at you that I'm not really, okay. I didn't want to overwhelm people. Okay, the 19A process. This is that second line. If I go back two slides, that where it says uh, DMV BDU. Okay. Article 19A of the Vehicle and Traffic Law was enacted to provide uh, improved road safety uh, uh, for commercial uh, school bus drivers and bus drivers. So essentially, before we can hire someone, we don't just hire them as a licensed driver. We have to put them on our 19A roster. So we have to get an abstract, which is a copy of their driver's license from DMV. They have to have a physical exam. And then once they have those two, we can send an application to the bus driver unit saying we want to hire this person as a bus driver. They will check that person's fingerprints, which we've already sent them for, to see if they're clear. All right. And then they get into a cycle that keeps repeating. Um, we do what's called a defensive driving review with every driver every year, uh, where we go out to make sure they're driving defensively. They can either be followed or we ride with them. Uh, they have to do a written exam every two years, a behind the wheel exam every two years, uh, we have to get that abstract every year. And with that abstract, we do an annual review of their driver record where we meet with that driver and say, you know, <clears throat> have you had any accidents in the last year? Have you had any convictions? Um, you know, if you have any of these things, you have to report them to us within so many days. And then they also have to have a physical. So, so this kind of revolving thing is a yearly cycle with every driver. And when I say driver, I don't mean just the 49 drivers. This includes anybody who's licensed to drive, from myself, the dispatchers, the mechanics, anyone who has a CDL that can go out on the road and transport students for us. So this is the 19A bus driver unit process. So these are the things that uh, we just got audited on. And they'll look to make sure that the defensive driving review is done within a year. They don't want to see that go past the year. If it's a year and a day, that's a potential violation. So that's how that goes. So this is a lot of internal work that a lot of folks don't see that we have to do just to keep our drivers um, certified. The state education department requirements, they require that we do a pre-service tra training with the driver on their curriculum before they go out to transport students. They require that they have a physical exam. Now both 19A and SED require physical exams. 19A requires it every two years, so if you're driving for the MTA, or for a charter um, Foxwoods line or something, you have to have an exam every two years. If you're driving a school bus, the SED requirement overrides that and you have to have a physical every year. We do a physical performance test, which measures certain things like the driver's ability to assist students in the event of an emergency. They have to be able to go up and down the bus steps three times in 30 seconds. They have to be able to evacuate themselves from the driver's seat through the rear door in 20 seconds. Uh, they have to move their hands and hold their foot on the brake for so long, and we have to drag a weighted bag 130 pounds, 30 feet in 30 seconds. So these are things that every driver ha has to do every two years. Some of these requirements, aside from the driving things like the, phys the, the physical performance test, they're also required um, for our bus monitors as well. So then we get into our fall refreshers, and they have to take a basic course of instruction, which is a little bit more intense than the pre-service course within their first year of driving. We do a spring refresher every year, and this physical performance test every year. So these are the things that SED wants us to go through to keep our drivers qualified. All right? I see people yawning, so I'm trying not to, to lose you guys. But as you can imagine, that's a lot of work to keep track of our drivers. So we have software programs that keep track of all the dates, everything is entered in there, and a, each driver has, in their driver file, they have a DMV file, they have an SED file, they have a DOT file, they have all these different separate small files that are in their files. Mr. Mack, in your professional associations, are you able to share best practices with, the, with one another? Presumably, all districts are experiencing these same standards. Yes. These big things we, are coming we do a lot up, of so. that. Okay. That, that slide with the MAP 21 thing, that yeah. came from a webinar that um, I, I participated in on one of my sick days. Um, that 
we um, I shared with my local chapter mm -hmm. so that they know because part of part of my responsibility as a local president is to make sure that uh, my surrounding districts and, and colleagues are kind of up to date on what they need to be doing as well. Okay. So we will we do that all the time. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so. This is still a little bit of the how do we get there type of thing. Do I get there? No, I get there. We're talking about how do we determine our needs when we look at what we need for buses. Well, we have a budget process that we start going through in January, February. <clears throat> and I come and I tell you, this is what I see happening in the district. This is how many students we have, how many um, schools we're going to, how many buses we need. Um, this LOI is a letter of intents. So we'll talk to our vendors and say, we intend to purchase upon board approval and upon voter approval. It's a contingent thing. It's not a binding thing. It's just so that our vendors know that we're looking to buy so many buses so that they can get their factory started in producing it. Um, <clears throat> then in the summertime, we do a lot of route planning. We pretty much uh, make sure that all the students are properly routed. Um, in the general, we look at general demographics. Uh, are the new housing complex going in? Um, you know, those sort of things. Is there a new private school that's opening up that's now taking students, that sort of stuff? Um, and then we look at school startup. So that's a kind of a, a continuous process. So when I looked at um, the last few years, and again, I'm missing a, a number here. Um, these are the number of public school students that we were transporting versus the number of private school students that we were transporting. So uh, if we look at a decline in numbers, that doesn't necessarily indicate a need for less buses. You just can't say, oh, we have 100 kids less than a district this year, so we need we don't need those two buses, because they're not all on the same buses. So, you know, you may have one kid from this neighborhood that moves out, or one kid from that neighborhood that moves out. Um, in determining our needs, and I'm talking proactive versus reactive versus responsive, because I do watch all of the board meetings, and I want you to Transportation is very much a, re a responsive um, service. We try to plan as much as we can, but we do need to react and respond to the needs that we're asking to provide. So we go through this whole process, but then we throw another another ball up in the air with the PBS placements, which happen throughout the year. But we never know. Um, it's not uncommon for us to get um, a placement for a student changing schools in April or May. That happens. Um, in the month of December, we got 23 requests for uh, special services in the month of December. We weren't even in session 23 days in September, in December. Right? So we try to be really, really hard, and it's a very, very challenge. And I'm always teasing for Ashley. <laughs> what do you got for us today? So how do we get there? We talked about um, where we are. Uh, we talked about... Um, you know, where we're going. Now I want to talk for a minute about how we get there. Uh, we look at vehicles, staffing, and other considerations. Because again, our human people, our, our bus drivers, our monitors, they're our most valuable resource. And I don't get the chance to tell them that enough. So I'm saying it so they can all hear it if they watch the YouTube. Um, they are our valuable resources. They're some really remarkable people. So we were looking at our vehicles. We were looking initially to surplus three buses and two school vans. Um, we may not be able to do that based on some numbers that I had been given today. The vehicles we were looking to purchase now, um, there was a slight change. Uh, Amber and I had a discussion earlier. Um, we were looking at initially trying to get three buses and three vans. Um, so we talked about that today. Now we're looking at possibly two buses and two and four vans. Um, so the reason for the vans is we do have uh, increased PPS placements. We do have an increase in our McKinney Bento students. Where we used to be able to run to Poughkeepsie with a car, and now we're running to Poughkeepsie with a van. Okay. Uh, there have been some really close days here where we were we put our last van on the road, and if something broke down, we got our fingers crossed. But we don't like being in that particular situation. Um, to touch for a second, now I put these prices in here, okay? I'm going to go into Pandora's box here for a second. 
um, seat belts. Just talk for a moment about seat belts. Uh, seat belts have been on all of all school buses in New York since 1987. Okay, they are currently not required by state law to be used in vehicles that have uh, a capacity. Currently, I messed this up. Currently, not required to to use in vehicles that have a capacity of more than 10 students. That should be that little thing should be reversed the other way. Um, if you have a vehicle that has a seating capacity of less than 10 students, uh, like a, a minivan or a car, those students are required by law to wear those seatbelts. Okay? Currently, local districts set the policy in New York. Okay? Governor Cuomo has come out with a proposal um, that uh, is very important this year. He has His proposal is to require all students in the state of New York to wear seatbelts. Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit about that, and I've shared some information with Dr. Landau and Anne-Marie about seatbelts. Um, but currently, the seatbelts that we have, we have uh, most of our buses have lap belts as opposed to shoulder belts. We have six vans that have lap shoulder belt combinations. Okay. Um, I spoke with our vendor. The additional cost to put those seatbelts in our full-size buses is somewhere between $9,500 and $12,500. The, the $9,500 cost would reduce their seating capacity from 73 to 72 or 70, I forget. Um, but the $12,500 figure would require us to put an additional 18 and make the bus 18 inches longer to retain our current 72 passenger capacity. So, but these are some of the costs associated with that. Um, does, does the proposal require, is it going to require lap belts or shoulder belts or both? That's a good question. We're trying to figure that one out ourselves. Okay. Um, the proposal isn't really clear. So, um, it's not really clear as to what he's asking us to do, except that it removes the exemption. Currently in state law, there's an exemption for passengers in vehicles. They are required to wear seatbelts unless they're in a school bus. So the governor's proposal removes that exemption, but it doesn't say what type of seatbelts we're, we're looking at, at doing. So where are we? Where are we going with this? Well, a couple of things. We have to start teaching our kids how to wear seatbelts on the buses. Okay. Um, some of the concerns that we have uh, and again, this is something that NIAF has put forth a position paper on. Um, concerns of cost, concerns of capacity, how it might affect our routes, um, how we're going to do this logistically. I mean, most of us, we get in the car, the family car, we tell this, our children buckle up, and they go click, and we know they're buckled up. That's not going to work on a school bus, okay? We can't have the driver get out of the seat every time the new student gets on the bus to make sure that they wear their seatbelt. So I know that there's um, quite amount of concern in the industry about whether, to what level drivers are going to be held liable for this as well. So there's a lot of discussion on this. It's a lot of it is up in the air right now. But I want to just kind of say this is the proposal that we're, we're being asked to consider. I don't know whether it's going to pass or not, um, but it's something that you know, we need to be prepared for if and when it does happen. So I have a question. You said that the $12,500 cost would require you to ex make the bus longer? Yes, because when you put these lap shoulder belts on a seat on a, on a bus, uh, you you need more room. I get that, but is that, does the, ex extending the, the length of the bus, is that included in the $12,500? Yes. It is? Yes. And move the bus would be uh, extended by 18 inches. Mind you, 18 is a very small, tight town, so we'll have a narrow streets. Okay. Uh, on our staffing considerations, um, I, we hear me talk about recruitment, hiring, training. There are going to be additional training expenses related to the entry level driver training. ELDT, and pardon me for not um, for 
figuring that out. But the ELDT is the entry level entry level driver training requirements that uh, FMCSA has put out. Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration has put out. So, um, how are we going to meet that requirement? Uh, one of the things that we can we have to change our training curriculum to comply with the criteria being promulgated by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. So. Do we, each school district, rewrite that criteria? That's a lot of work in training trainers to retrain and document and do that sort of stuff. There are a couple of companies out there that are looking to um, provide training curricula for us. And two of them, one of them is the PTSI, the People Transportation Safety Institute, and the other one is the School Bus Safety Company. Um, and they are still in the process of putting this stuff together. So the PTSI program would be a computer-based program that an applicant could sit through and go through at their own pace. Um, the school bus safety company, I think, is more a curriculum that they would provide for us that we can use with our driver trainings. Each one has their advantages. Um, typically, when we, when we get new people coming in, they don't come in in droves. It's not like we start a class and we have eight drivers new and now in training. They tend to come in one, two at a time. So maybe a computer-based training program where they can go through the module at their own speed might be the way to go. Or maybe the curriculum. Curriculum um, training is very labor-intensive when you start talking about training one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, so I. These are some of the programs that are out there. I think the school bus safety company is gonna have like a $5,000 price tag to it. Uh, the PTSI, I'm not sure how they're gonna market it or how much what the costs are gonna be. Um, I would like to see our statewide agency put something together. Um, but this is, again, a big change for us that we're gonna be tackling this year. Other considerations, uh, some of these things I've talked about in the past, um, generators. Uh, we have um, two buildings over there that we need to make sure are operational. Um, if the lights go out, the power goes out in the middle of the day, and that bus garage has 10 doors that are 16 feet wide and 14 feet high, that's a lot of doors to lift. We don't have the pulleys on them that open them. They only open electrically. So, um, that's a consideration that we need to have in terms of moving forward. Um, lightning protection, I only list this because um, the cost that we incurred, that 14 grand uh, to repair that, you know, lightning happens in a flash, and six months later in November, August, September, October, November, four months later, we're still trying to get everything up and running. Um, space, we're very tight at the bus garage. It's, um, you know, we, we, we have a, a lot going on. We talked about the number of schools we go to, the number of phone calls we get, the amount of driver qualification, requalification, uh, material that we need to keep track of, um, the amount of trip requests coming in. It's all, it, we get a lot. Some days I feel like I'm <laughs> taking it, but it's, it's tight in there. So we've been trying to talk about what we can do to maximize our office space. And then the other, um, other topic we have to talk about is our underground storage tank removal and replacement with an above ground storage tank. Right now we have two storage tanks for our petroleum bulk fuel. Uh, one is above ground, our gasoline is above ground, our diesel is below ground. Um, we removed our below ground diesel of below ground gas in 2011. Um, these tanks pretty much have a safe lifespan of about 30 years. We're approaching 24, 25 in our underground diesel tank. The last thing we need to do is to start incurring fines from the DEC if, if that tank has problems. So we need to start talking about uh, removing that underground storage tank and replacing it with above ground storage tank. Um, the regulations are a lot simpler for us. The leak detection methods are a lot easier. You can actually see if an above ground tank is leaking because you can visually inspect it as opposed to a below ground tank. Um, when DEC issues fines, they like to issue fines of like $37,500 a day. So we don't want to kind of start getting those fines. Oh, and I want to 
months ago. I, I wanted to mention here, we have a couple of full-time staff who are approaching retirement. Um, some key people, our head bus driver, who has been with us for 30 years. Um, he plays a very key role in keeping our students safe. He's a very knowledgeable person. Um, he, he treats these buses like they're his children. Um, he knows them inside and out. Uh, and he does a lot of the uh, petroleum bulk stuff. Um, I, I can't speak to the amount of knowledge and, and, and value that this man has to the district. So part of our plan as we move forward in our five-year plan is hiring key staff. Uh, mechanics are very much sought after right now. There's a, 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 it's a mechanics market right now. So we need to consider what we're looking at because they play a key role, in especially our head mechanic, in keeping these buses and our students in safe condition. Uh, vehicle replacement and our physical plan concerns that I just touched on. Okay, so uh, I have another slide that I'm going to move to because this is something we kind of made some changes on today. So bear with me for a second. You can make some changes here. Okay, I notice it went to red. I made the change here because we're talking next year instead of replacing three buses and three vans, and we're now looking at possibly replacing two buses and four vans. And that's now an estimated 450,000. And then in 2020 to 2021, we were looking at three vans and one bus for an estimated 450,000. And in 21, 22, we're looking at um, possibly three buses. And this goes back, I went and I looked at each, uh, all of the vehicles we have, what year we acquired them, what their mileage is at. Um, tried to compare that to our enrollment figures and what we're looking at, what we're going to need, so that we can kind of move forward from here. I, I can only figure out three years out. I, um, that's the best I could do at this point. But so we're looking at 450,000 for the next two years, and then possibly after that, 430,000. Now these figures don't reflect any cost increase of vehicles for adding seatbelts in, the uh, black shoulder belts. I just wanted to put that out there. I still the blank slide. Some of our <coughs> physical plant concerns, I talked about the un removing the underground storage tank, adding an above ground storage tank, installing generators. Uh, we need to replace some of the doors in our facility, and we need to kind of find some more office space somewhere. Um, it, uh, those of you who came on the tour, you saw our driver's room, and then you start talking about having 40 people out there coming in to check in every day, and then another 29 monitors coming in to check in every day. Uh, that room gets really busy really fast and packed really tight. You know, they're an enthusiastic bunch. Up there talking a bunch. So um, sometimes it's it, it makes it hard to concentrate on all the things that we need to do, all the dots that need to be dotted and things that need to be crossed. So, so the two things you brought up space twice, are you asking to expand the bus garage? Is that something that you're seeking to do down the road? I'm looking at what options might be available to us okay. for space. So okay. really do, do you have a cost of what the uh, pulling the above ground, underground tank out and replacing with the above ground tank? I don't at this point. Um, we, <coughs> we did just change um, petroleum vendors, so I mean I could probably try and get some preliminary costs on that. Yeah, if you could and see what they might be. Let's see here. I had a question. Um, if you were to expand the bus garage, uh, would you expand it towards the stadium or in some other direction? Well, we haven't really, we haven't talked, really about talked about extending stuff. it. Right. We're, we're trying to be a little bit more creative in our space needs rather than adding on to the bus garage because um, it will not be aidable, so we have to be careful in doing that. Um, so we're just trying to be a little bit more creative. I think Ron just wanted to mention the fact about space, that it is an issue when we're trying um, to work on a solution. Okay. Um, and he closed
closing, I just wanted to um, share some of the staff that we've lost in the last year and a half. Um, uh, it's been, been a tough year for us. You know, we, uh, we lost Deb last uh, uh, August of 17. Uh, we had uh, Colin Keenan, who passed away this year, Sue Sweeney, who passed away this year, um, one of our bus monitors, Elva Gerton, who passed away this year, and one of our retired drivers, uh, Walt Thomas, just passed away uh, a few weeks ago. I just wanted to say these, these are people that did a lot of work for us. These are the faces of, uh, of, of, that our kids see first every day and last when they get off the bus. So um, we miss these guys. Any questions? Question? I have one more question. The, um, have we tried to apply for funding to use a clean process program? Can you repeat that, Anthony? Have we tried to apply for funding for the EPA Clean Busing Program? EPA Clean Busing Program. The last grants that I looked at were, um, I want to say DARA grants, the part, um, and one of the things that they are looking to do is they're, they're not, um, when you look at these grants, a lot of them, they don't want you to increase the size of your fleet. The goal is to take existing vehicles off the road and replace them with um, vehicles that are going to have less fuel emissions. So the buses that we're buying now um, are all equipped with um, diesel particulate filters um, and S there's two types of diesel uh, emission reductions that we have. There's SGR and DEF. Uh, DEF is diesel emulsification fluid that's added into the system. And what that does is it removes some of the particulates out the uh, EGR, <coughs> I believe, is one of the systems where the um, it superheats the, the carbons and it's collected in like a platinum filter. So we are uh, our, our buses that we have right now. They're not the old smoke spewing uh, diesel fuel buses that we that you and I went to school on. They're a lot cleaner. Um, but again, some of those grants, they're they're not. To help us, when we're trying to increase the size of our fleet. These are ones that are a lot of the grants they want you to actually do things like cut up engine blocks and render the vehicles useless um, so that they can't be used on the road. The other thing I want to just mention is that um, after our sustainability committee, I reached out to Ron to do some investigation. So he is um, having some email conversations with actually now it's two districts we know of that have vehicles that use alternate type of fuel. So we're, we're just starting the process for that um, going forward. So um, we will give you more information as that comes about. And for your budget request this year is, you know, I didn't see any numbers. So what, what is the request or proposal on budget? The budget numbers um, for the running of the department is flat and the only increases is our salary, contractual salary increases. And I will be getting you the full budget line by line relatively soon um, so that you can look at each item. The only difference then is the bus proposition, but everything else is flat in transportation. Uh, I'll say I'm, ha I'm happy to see that, and it sounds like more useful, that we're going from three full-size buses down to two, increasing the vans, especially hearing the changes in the, uh, the different um, numbers and locations we have to, to transport to, so that makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. I appreciate seeing some three-year planning ahead. That's a good initiative. And ju just to say, I'll do my best, but it, you may not be able to hold me to that. Who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Thank you very much, Ron. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. On training, um, we, we're, are we planning to do the entire training sequence in-house here? Is that the drift that I get? Well, let me address that by saying um, sometimes we are fortunate to have drivers come in that are fully licensed. Okay, uh, more often than not, um, you know, we're we're reaching out and having people come and say, "I'd like to do this. Can you help me get?" Okay, um, we we have had uh, some folks that come in and they're currently enrolled in the driving school, and they're paying driving school fees um, to get training from driving schools on how to drive a school bus. But you know, 
I like to think that we do it from a di different perspective because we do it from the perspective that these people are going to be working for us. They're going to be transporting our students. Um, uh, just to put it on a personal perspective, um, my son's best friend, uh, his his mom had hired him to go to had hired a driving instructor to go to driving school. And I said, well, let me take him out a couple times and go driving with him. And she said, well, you know, I haven't gone to such and such driving school. You don't really need to do that. And I said, well, let me ask you one question. Who is the most likely person going to be in that car with him? My kid. Okay. So I had a vested interest in making sure that he didn't just go out with the driving school five or six times. That when he got behind the wheel of the car, he knew what he was doing. He knew everything from handling multi-lane traffic to, and he asked me, Mr. Mackey, why are we driving up and down the lanes of Walmart? Just as somebody backed out in front of him. I'm like, this is why we're driving up and down the lanes of Walmart. So when you talk about driving, there's a whole whole skill set that's out there that I think that a lot of folks don't don't get. But I can tell you that, you know, we want our drivers to be well trained. And that's why, you know, I think it's it's sometimes a personal investment for us that we invest in doing that with them because we know what we've taught them. Whereas when they come in from somewhere else, we don't always know. Does BOCES have a program for driver training also or no? I do not believe they do. But the, but BOCES does do certain aspects of it. Um, I know that BOCES offers the, um, in this particular section here, the basic course of instruction. We have sent drivers to that. That's a set state ed curriculum. So that we, uh, if we only have one or two or three drivers that we fired new that year that need to go through that course, it doesn't necessarily move us to set aside a whole week of training with them. We can send them up to the Bozies to get that training with colleagues of mine from other districts that are doing it. How's our pay scale looking in terms of attracting drivers, or is that an issue, or is it more just that there's not a lot of people in the pool out there? It is somewhat competitive. Um, I don't think that's necessarily, um, you know, when, when I do, when, I, when people leave, a lot of the reasons that they give us aren't necessarily salary, it's more or less benefits, those types of things. Um, so those are the things that drivers are looking for. You know, I have, I have lost drivers to districts that give different benefits than we do. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ron. All right, the next presentation is Dr. Landau with the Equity Report Card. I'm just going to give a brief introduction, Celia, um, who has been working on putting this together. Is we're going to put it up on the screen. So the Equity Report Card is something that we've been working on for several months. It was a goal of the board last year to get it in place, and, uh, and we have, uh, I, th I think, a good start that we wanted to show you. So just in terms of process, um, you know, we'd love to have a, a brief conversation about tonight. Celia's not going to do an exhaustive, like, every single part of the report card. She's just going to show you some highlights. Um, I don't think it really requires a, a vote, but we're kind of looking for a, a nod from the board to go forward and sharing this with the public, because what we envision as a next step uh, is that the uh, diversity committee, which meets in a few weeks, um, th that you know it will be out with the public, and Anthony, as chair of that committee, will send it to his uh, email list of people that attend that committee. And that uh, kind of a, a deeper discussion will happen at the diversity committee in March. Um, I will weave it into my uh, to my public dis conversations about the uh, strategic plan. Um, prob maybe also do an event or two just centered on the equity report card. Uh, and um, the other thing I want to say about the equity report card is uh, so what we have in place now does not have to be forever. So if there's a better way of looking at a certain piece of data or if there's other data that you feel should be on there, uh, just let us know. Uh, Celia 
and myself would be the people to let know. It's a little, we can't do like a, you know, a turn on a dime and get it up the next day kind of thing. It'll be a little bit of a process, but we'd love to just hear what you think about things that should be on there that aren't, or um, ways of looking at the data that we're currently, you know, not looking at a certain way. Cecilia, you want to walk us through a couple of the... Thanks, Dr. Lando, for the education. Um, as we talked about, this has been a work in progress for um, many months. I'll just say, um, for those of you that have been on the board, you know that we've been talking about data over the last several years. Was the most important task for us as a district of ensuring that we have validity and reliability of all of the data that we report out uh, across across the district. Um, and so when we talk, uh, I'm gonna share just a little bit of how we got to what I'm gonna uh, highlight for you and showcase in our data tool, um, but know that it came uh, through some critical steps. Uh, one being that we're reviewing continuously and reporting uh, what our reported data has been over our longitudinal as well as our annual data of recent school year to ensure that the data that we're putting into uh, our equity report card as well as our other uh, reporting mechanisms for state and or federal government reporting is reliable and has integrity. Um, uh, also along the lines, we did numerous data extracts of our source data. So identifying what were the sources of the data and for myself and our staff, um, we pulled uh, at, at a minimum of 126 various uh, data extracts. Um, and I'll share an example of that. Um, then what was important was identify, identifying with our consultant uh, what were effective visual representations, what were the ways that we could best give a, um, a visual understanding of what some of the data elements are and what, what they may mean. Um, for us, we wanted to ensure that the data was interactive and so what it really does for us and is a tool uh, really to promote our thinking uh, and for, to allow us the way uh, in, in our various um, committees uh, to be able to think about uh, what's happening for students, uh, both at an individual student level, uh, uh, at a grade level, or within a particular school level, what that might mean or what the, our data represents in terms of the types of school processes that we have in place or that we might like to see in place, and what does it mean for our organizational systems and structures. And so this is a really robust tool uh, I want to share with you just a quick glance. You know, this is how we're used to, used to seeing data. And so again, um, you know, a big uh, acknowledgement uh, needs to go out to a couple of key folks that have worked with me on this. Um, one, I'd like to note that uh, behind the scenes, uh, Ms. Kim Stavali uh, is, always, is our district data specialist. Um, you don't typically see her in the forefront or in a, in a public setting as it relates to the data work that's happening. But she's a, she's a key player in what happens across all levels of our, of our district with the coordination of student level data for the reporting and the management of the, stu the student management systems that we use. Ms. Jean Splinsky has been critical. She's my secretary, and Mr. Wright's secretary, uh, in helping to work in converting raw data that we were gathering from our schools that are not necessarily in existing uh, data reports and being able to translate those into data spreadsheets. That we then were working with our consultant, Ms. Liza Lucky, who was uh, working on the data analytics software side of this and taking lots of reports and lots of uh, spreadsheets of raw, raw data about our students, our various school processes, or student outcomes, to be able to put it into a tool, the tool that you'll see before you. I know you've had opportunity to explore this as board members. I want to just give you kind of a quick highlights. There's three. Uh, can, what we call containers in terms of the type of data that we've built into this initial framework of our equity report card. Those relate to uh, data elements that you'll be able to interact with, that you'll be able to sort and filter to look at a whole uh, school-wide or a whole district-wide uh, picture at a glance, as well as to be able to refine and filter that down into individual grade levels or within individual schools. And that relates to uh, factors that speak to what's happening for us uh, district-wide around student achievement. And so looking at our assessment scores at all levels, looking at what our high school enrollments look like in accelerated learning opportunities, such as 
uh, AP coursework uh, or Dutchess Community College coursework or honors courses across the district. What does that look like in terms of a student who aspire to go on to post-secondary education? What does this speak to student achievement speak to in terms of the SAT and ACT results that our high school students have been gaining? We're looking at student engagement. So being able to take a look at extracurricular clubs and activities and athletic participation. Looking at students who are partaking in uh, music enrichment opportunities of chorus and band from elementary, middle through high school. Looking at factors that affect student instructional time in the classroom and have an impact on student engagement. Looking at uh, incidents of suspension or referrals. We're looking at college and career readiness. So what's happening for our scholars as they're getting ready to leave us in terms of overall graduation rates, what the exit outcomes look like, where students are planning to go to, and then ultimately what our post-secondary plans. Um, I just want to share a couple of quick highlights for you. So this is the welcome page, is the organizer. It gives you just a broad sense. We've uh, worked to build longitudinal data, doing a look back uh, over the last uh, four to five years. Um, what, you'll, what we will do is we'll continue to build into this as our data goes through the uh, various levels of the verification process. And so once we have data that has been reported out uh, to the state or we've, uh, and has been considered certified and verified at the, uh, with Dr. Landell's uh, certification, then we'll be able to add that in for the following uh, school year's data. So quick glance there. Um, Overall demographics of the district you'll find in this tab under K-12 enrollment. As you can see, we can take a look at this and either identify if we have a particular year that we want to pay that we want to pay attention to or understand more of, or we can look at it across uh, the whole the whole spectrum of the years there. Um, you saw the the spreadsheet of what uh, ELA or math data look like. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but all of this data, flip back for a moment, that you see represented in tables and percentages and uh, numbers becomes a visual representation in terms of trend charts, um, being able to look both uh, in uh, bar graphs of percentages as well as trends over time. With particular interest, we did a lot to pull from our uh, records of master schedule uh, and to be able to see what participation looks like across honors, AP, or Dutchess Community College courses. For those of us at various levels or perhaps within a department, we might want to take a fine-tuned look in particular areas of study within a department and see what that participation looks like. And with quick, with a click uh, and the filter, you'll see that it changes and shifts what the uh, participation rates look like and what accounts for our students. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. The assessment data is in here, as you see, across elementary, middle school, or through our 3 through 8 testing program, our regents data. Uh, college readiness uh, outcomes speak to uh, participation in uh, the ACT or the SAT scores. Um, I'd like to share with you what it looks like to take a massive amount of extracurricular data. <coughs> and to be able to show you that we can take a look at what is happening for all of our students at all levels and look at broad trends, as well as be able to drill that down with, uh, within a particular uh, area. Okay, so we can look both at an individual granular level as well as holistically across our schools. As Dr. Lindo was saying, this is the beginning of the framework we're building. And so what we know is we continue to uh, gather and create data systems uh, within, within our schools and across the district, we'll be able to pull from that. So being able ultimately to pull uh, elementary reading uh, data in, uh, which, is a, which is a local source of data. But that too then can cross layer, not just the, what assessment outcomes look like at a state assessment level, but also what that speak means in terms of instructional practice uh, within the classrooms. Yes, okay. go ahead, Mr. Ritesky. For um, Can you show, for example, the high school athletics? Yep. 
You're showing numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do percentages? So per what percentage? What that percent be? looks like? Right, right. It's not built in here to do that right this minute um, because uh, we put this in uh, as aggregate numbers, right. uh, but with a little more refinement of the work. Yeah, just are we reaching how, what percentage of mm -hmm. each, you know, the total body are we are we right. getting into sports? Maybe yep. you know, yeah. those kind yeah. of things. Absolutely. The right. number at the top of each bar represents yes. the number of students. Correct? Number of students. Yeah. And yeah. in this case, there, it's disaggregated by uh, racial and ethnic uh, identification. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Fair enough. So this is this is an example. This data doesn't exist as necessarily as a data source, but in terms of taking um, the enrollment participation data that's happening and being gathered by our club advisors and through the school principals in their offices, and then um, being able to cross-reference that with who our students are that are enrolled in those, and then connecting it back to um, student demographics, and then redacting that information so that it goes into this, this tool. So that's the behind the scenes work that happened at a few different levels between. So this is the initial setup of it, and yes. as Dr. Lando said, it's a live document, so you guys are gonna be tweaking it and stuff, so. I mean, this is a lot of great information yeah. that's readily exactly. available. I mean, yeah. I can assume educators and administrators and the public viewing this is, it's great. Yeah, and certainly what we wanna hear is feedback. So as uh, groups, whether it's our um, departments or our grade level teams that, or principals working with their teams within the school or some of our district-wide committees are using it as a tool and asking the kinds of questions it'll be a tool for the strategic planning committee um, it'll, it's a tool for our equity teams at each school but is it 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 helps to assist them in identifying what are the key and critical questions that they're looking to answer the feedback back is or is this helping or what else would help next? What helps us move to the next level of work? And that's the power of this. And that's why I wanted to make it as an interactive and that it's something that we continue to build over time. What's the support data file? What's the what's the program that it's in? Do you know? It doesn't matter. Uh, this one is called Tableau. Okay. It's not one that I have familiarity with. I know I have to give, again, I can't say enough for um, Liza Lucky, who's our consultant, because it was a tool that she uh, you know, her time was invested on the front end of really getting this and figuring out all the various ways that we could represent large volumes of data and make them visually meaningful. And our, so just, okay. Yep. Did you want to finish? Well, it just as a follow-up to that, um, mm -hmm. if, is there, uh, when you're collecting this data, so this is the interface that it's put into, but is there a way, and an ongoing way for it to be continue, continually entered like you're not going to have to go through the gathering process in the same way again. If there's a there's a place to enter this on an ongoing basis. Right? Yeah. Or so that right. those are still you know kind of the things to work out in sure. terms of the who, but it will, won't be the kind of thing that we'll rely always on consultant <coughs> consultant support to do. Um, but it'll be then how we continue to uh, maintain and, and and refresh. So it's still coming from separate files that you then pull into a data file that gets dumped into the into this program. I yes. don't know the full answer to that, but yes. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you yes. that I think it is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll let you know what's my thoughts about that. Okay. Just. Other questions? Oh, one last thing, um, just quick glance. What we also wanted to include uh, for all of our uh, community of stakeholders was as much of a glossary of terms to help kind of define um, what are some of the key elements that they may see or be interacting with there. And that, again, we want feedback of what else would be helpful. Well, I, I have two questions, and one I might not just be saying yep. it. Um, how do you define economically disadvantaged is one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second question is if there's a way to see uh, a cross-reference between racial breakdown, demographics, and economically disadvantaged to see if, kind of, does that make sense? It does, so I'll answer the first part of the question. Um, economically disadvantaged is identified as students who are identified as for uh, qualifying for free and reduced lunch okay. um, that are either um, self-identified through the family uh, on an annual basis uh, through application or our direct certifications through because they receive uh, uh, some form of um, state or, or uh, county level assistance um, and so that's the, that's the first uh, factor uh, we talked about kind of the overlay of the interface uh, and that will probably be the sophistication of this as we continue to build it out so to be able to say, like, right. you know, which students represent both 
those that may be economically disadvantaged that may have an IEP or a second language need and fall within a particular uh, racial or ethnic identification. Because right. it would be helpful, I think, um, as you kind of look through the data, you can parse out depending on how you look at it yeah. to see where some of the disparities, what lines they fall on. Yeah. So it would be helpful to be able to kind of tell us this. Um, mm -hmm. Are these disparities falling strictly along race lines or are they oftentimes being just more related to economic disadvantage or mm -hmm. vice versa? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I would, so I uh, say to all of us, uh, this is like version 1.0 uh, and knowing that we'll continue to add to the sophistication of it. Because the data analytics tools themselves allow for a lot uh, uh, we, to be able maybe to. Maybe another way to put it is do we have a list of uh, the students who qualify for free and reduced price lunch broken by by race? We know that from our data reporting systems. Right. Yeah. Okay. Where it shows uh, do, uh, it, where if students fall in one or uh, multiple uh, student subgroup categories. Okay. Yes. So we, we have that level of data. Just doesn't uh, kind of nicely fit in a, gotcha. in a visual tool yet. I'll say too that more, um, having sent this earlier and like looking mm -hmm. through it, it's really impressive because even just for a first draft to be able to orient yourself enough to see where there's information you'd like to see more of mm -hmm. or in you know discrete audiences that you'd like to be broken down means that it's already providing a lot of good information. So it definitely reflects a lot of hard work. Yeah. It's very I, clear. I, I mean, I, these kinds of tools um, the, and the power of data analytics um, certainly will allow us to, to dig deeply in areas um, that uh, you know, from my career where we used, uh, you know, pivot tables in, spread, in uh, you know, spreadsheets uh, and Excel, I mean, this takes it to a whole nother level. Other questions or thoughts or feedback? Uh, how do we maintain this going forward and keep updating it so that it's a continuing living document? Um, I, I mean, I think it's it becomes part of you know the way we um, you know we're responding to what may be emerging needs, but also then build in as part of the system you know um, kind of annual tasks around it because there are certain periods of time where uh, our data you know is considered certified and verified, um, and those would be the points in time where those that are state reported data make sense to be then added into the tool. So I think a, a schedule and a timeline for some of that, but then also having the flexibility that it can respond to you know, emerging needs. I, I might be rewording Craig and Kristen's question. Okay. Um, but does this have, so this Tableau public, does this have like a back end that we can update or do we have to have someone who's a specialist in this you know, is it, is it built to be a structure that we can, someone who works for the district can easily just punch in this year's data? And, it is you know, built to be, way? it is built to be a tool that we then have, have the ability to maintain. So we don't necessarily basis. need to have a... So it's not a reoccurring expert. cost, of, right. but it will require some training time um, to mm -hmm. get somebody, you know, um, functional with, with the software mm -hmm. and then how to, uh, how to uh, maintain information in it and your work. Does the data come from the state ed in the same sort of files? Is it something that, like the things that you're pulling from, is it, is it, when you get that data sent to you, like how does that data set come? So all of our data lives within our, our student management system or other um, accountability reporting systems that we have within our own servers. Okay. We, that we report up first to level, what's considered level zero, is when we first do the, the extract and the upload. And then it goes, uh, and that's at the local level. Extract <coughs> to where? We extract out of our student management software system. For, into this? That, not into this directly, oh. to Tableau, but just in terms of data reporting. Okay. Goes uh, to, uh, at the regional level, to the regional information centers. Okay. Um, then they, what's considered level zero is where we still have the ability to, you know, take the extract and then ensure that it's, it's valid data we're reporting up. It gets locked into level one. We have access at a school level and at a district administrative level to review those level one reports mm -hmm. uh, once those become open. And then there's what's considered level two. Level two is, again, where we have access. So, the, so like things like this data table that you see, mm -hmm. 
um, is a data report that I pulled out of level one that gave a lot of in longitudinal information in a very concise way that then Liza was able to take and be able to convert into the uh, software tool of uh, Tableau. Right. Um, but these are all data elements that we have access to at a school district and uh, school administrative level. But it all lives within the management system that the district has. But it all generates, a it all generates right. from our student management system. And if there are changes in that or if there's things that we see as discrepancies, so this is where data reviewing and uh, ensuring you know, what we call verification timeframes is so important because when we're in a period to verify, we still have the ability that if something doesn't look correct, we go back, research it, figure out why. There's some, lots of reasons that can you know, prompt. Um, you know, we have the wrong exit date, for example, of a student that mm -hmm. changes how data gets reported out. Um, th th things like that. Um, things like what's important, um, not to get too deep, but like in this, with, where it's about state assessment data, what's really critical, particularly with um, our uh, percentage of, of students that may be opted out of tests, it's really important to know that all those students are accounted in the not tested uh, and that they're coded appropriately at a, at a school and then ultimately at our, in our district uh, reporting for assessment uh, results as you know, the reason why they didn't participate in the test. Uh, because that has an impact down the road in terms of what our uh, accountability looks like in terms of percentage of students at proficiency. So if we're not looking at those data sources, and we're not you, you know, taking the opportunity to review this for a principal level, are all of the students in this particular grade level, are they accounted for, are they accounted for as to if they didn't take the test, why they didn't take the test? And then alerting um, Kim Stavali, for example, that there may be something that's a mismatch or something that needs to be corrected. That's where in the past we've run into, into issues of the data that gets reported out of the state maybe doesn't look exactly the way we understood it at a school level. But there's lots of benchmark times throughout a school year that allow us lot, many opportunities to verify the data. Because it's such a, it's a significant population and there's a lot of cost management in terms of it. Um, had, was there a consideration of a student with disabilities um, tab? Let me see that. Um, tell me, is students with disabilities? Like PPM, like uh, students are all students. Um, uh, enrollment wise, you'll see that reflected here. And here along the bottom. So just our overall percentages of students with disabilities um, as a total as a total population. I'm going to break that down you know further in terms of school by school and grade by grade. Uh, in terms of looking at achievement data, you'll find it represented uh, over here. Um, you'll see where it talks about by classification of student. Mm -hmm. So uh, what the performance of our students who are English language learners uh, who are students who may be students with disabilities uh, in comparison to their um, to their uh, general education peers. So we look at them for achievement, but, okay. Mm -hmm. we, do we have access to, I see the student suspension uh, tab, I'm looking at that. That's referring only to out of school suspensions, then, right? Yes, in this, in what, what you see right here. Do we have access to any other kind of disciplinary data, like the in school suspensions or we do. Uh, we do and there's a lot more that this can be built out with. Yeah. Detentions are those more Deten low level kind of disciplinary we, stuff. I mean orders. everything is tracked. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Um, it could be something that that's where that's why I wanted to emphasize at the beginning, although this represents a lot of work, um, we do see it as the beginning or 1.0 yeah. version and so there's other things we can add. We know that came up in the last diversity meeting from some members of the uh, public to for us to look past just out of school suspensions too so we well, I think it'd be really we, great. We kind of started a little bit already so we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more this spring. Yeah I think that'd be great especially when we're moving and we think about like restorative practices and different kinds of things and ways to uh, really track both like what, how traditional 
disciplinary methods are, are functioning or not functioning, and also kind of have a, as we change our methods, it would be great to be able to try. Yeah, this will serve as a baseline for sure. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. All right, I need a motion to adjourn to executive session to review the employment history of a particular individual. So moved. Second. Comments or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Um, so I'd like to have us please rise for a moment of silence for Walter Thomas, who retired after 20 years of service as a, a bus driver for the school district, and for Michael J. Tursey, who retired at, in 2002 after 35 years as a service and maintenance uh, mechanic for the school district. Thank you. When we reviewed the agenda, there are no additional items or corrections to the agenda. Um, any student or school presentations? Seeing none, we're going to go to parent groups. Seeing none, we're going to go open to the public. Anybody that wishes to address the board may address the board at this time. Seeing none, we're going to go to the superintendent's report. All right, I will be very brief. We had a great professional learning day on Friday. Thank you, Eric Wright, for organizing the day. We had lots of different activities, I think, anchored well in our strategic plan. A focus on uh, relationship building through the restorative practices training and the responsive classroom training, and then also a focus on student engagement uh, through STEM uh, facilitation and uh, technology workshops. It was a really good day. I also had a chance to go over the strategic plan with all the educators in the district at the beginning, and uh, I think that went all, all off uh, to a great start. The conversations are continuing in the district. I've been meeting with PTOs. I have two this week. Forestal is tomorrow at 4 o'clock, and uh, Sergeant is on Thursday at 345, where I'm just going over uh, the initial parts of the strategic plan. The student focus groups are continuing. Annie and Noah have been attending all of the high school ones, so thanks for putting in the time. And uh, I'm meeting with uh, students from each grade at Roundabout, fifth graders from each school, and, uh, and high school students from each grade. And it's so much fun. I think I'm just going to go back and do another round with a whole fresh new group of kids because uh, it's uh, been very enlightening. And uh, finally, just to preview the next board meeting, we're uh, excited to focus on the instructional part of the budget. So uh, our hope, we'll do, also, we'll do PPS and also the instructional part. And so what we want to put in front of the board for that meeting is our three-year plan for um, staffing for the instructional side of the district, uh, for the uh, programming, a three-year plan for the pro pro instructional programming in the district, and a three-year plan for professional development in the district. And we hope it to be a conversation uh, with the board, not a final product on March 25th, but something that we get some feedback from you all. And so we are gearing up for that right now, and, uh, and it's a busy time of year, but a good kind of busy, and we're just rolling right now. Awesome. Any questions? All right. We have no unfinished business, so we're going to go to committee reports, including board comments. We're going to start with our student reps, no one any. Alrighty. Um, last morning, the last board meeting, uh, it was the week of the eighth grade orientation. So just to recap that a little bit. Um, I was a little surprised about how many people showed up, I have to admit, but there was uh, a great outcome. Uh, the presentation uh, was very informative. I got to speak with some of the uh, parents and students after the presentation. They all found it very informative, just going over graduation requirements, the classes we have now. How high school is different than roundabout and just all the things they can expect. We had all the clubs lined up outside and there was definitely a lot of interest in clubs. Um, each club had a sign-up sheet um, and I think clubs averaged about around 10 kids uh, per club, so that's definitely nice to see. Um, I want to congratulate Anya Gunn. She's a junior. She received a uh, science award, which is a $40,000 scholarship to RPI. So that, was, uh, that happened this week. 
And I also want to extend my congratulations to Jenna Matthew and Brown Rochosa. They bowled at States this weekend um, and finished out their high school bowling careers, and they've both been bowling for uh, all four years in high school. Thank you. Uh, I would like to talk about the Beacon High School's math team. They did very well at leagues, so they're going on to sectionals uh, this Wednesday. So I just wanted to shout them out. Uh, Mr. Riley and Mr. Atwell were doing a great job uh, in teaching all of them. Um, and I would also like to extend my congratulations to Jenna Murphy and Brianna um, for attending bowling states this uh, passing weekend and also on your gun. Um, and I would like to talk about the database. I thought that was really cool. Uh, it was really exciting because I like working with almost tangible information. So I thought it was really cool that um, this was going to be open to the public. Yeah. Just a quick add on. Uh, so we will be uh, posting, I guess is the word for uh, interested juniors. Uh, to apply to be uh, student advisors to the board. Our hope, our goal is uh, Mrs. Uh, Soto and I will identify uh, the two students in April and then, uh, as Noah put it, we'll create the kids table and have them uh, attend, <laughs> have them attend a, a few board meetings before the end of the year so they can learn from the uh, the first ever student advisors to the board in Beacon and uh, it's hard to imagine someone else doing it. Uh, but, uh, but, but Noah especially seems very um, eager to pass his knowledge along. Because <laughs> every time I see him, he asks me, have you got the new board member or the new student advisor yet? So, uh, so Mrs. Soto and I are working on it and we'll have them in place in April to have the transition of advisory power to happen. But uh, there'll be more thanks later. But you know, I think what sometimes isn't noticed is they do a lot of behind the scenes work in their role as student advisors uh, to the board and uh, them making the time to be at every one of these meetings that I'm having with students is, is really cool. And they don't, they listen, uh, they don't try to jump in, you know, and they let the students speak, but then they kind of debrief with me afterwards and it's just really cool uh, to have that. So thank you both for all the time you put in and, uh, and I'm excited to See who wants to do it next. <laughs> James. Talk us up. Policy and safety. Um, I wanted to say I had the opportunity to go see the Dutchess County uh, Student Art Show that's at Student New Falls. It's in the, the rotunda, it's two floors. It was so much more art than I expected to see. There are hundreds of artists from all over. Um, I did my best to take note of all of our beacon artists eight that I found. There were hundreds of artists. It was possible I missed, but I want to give a congratulations from Rombout to Labiba Hassan, Lindsay Otero, from Beacon High School, Molly Robinson, Rosa Nunez, Lauren Simon, Sydney Kurtz, Jolie Russell, and our own, I'm going to try it, Tolu Ulase, Akinwunmi. Is that right, Annie? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> to Annie. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, she's an amazing self-portrait there. Thank you. Uh, That's fantastic. Congratulations. Um, committee reports. Uh, we had a policy committee meeting. Uh, it was very productive. We have the next one is on uh, March 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, and it's followed by a diversity committee committee meeting, which Anthony, I believe, will talk to maybe, but I'll announce it anyway to make it easier. At it's following the same day, March 21st at 8:15. Safety. Next meeting. We are. Uh, we're working with um, April twenty. April twenty fourth. Uh, James, you said Tuesdays and Wednesdays work for you. Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Wednesdays. 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 Great. That's good because that's yeah. Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Anything special on the policies that are on first read for tonight? What do we have. We have uh, musical like, instrument, IE, and the charging school meals and uh, prohibition again. That's right. So most of it's pretty straightforward. There's a small adjustment to the, uh, uh, where I'm looking at it, is the approving of meal programs, we'll get to the exact policy number, which we can bring up for discussion. Uh, 8505? 
That's right. We just we, we soften and open the language um, about the <laughs> pursuit of students who qualify for free and reduced price lunch um, after the, the semester has gone on that may have uh, outstanding balance. We change the language a little bit to give the district more options in terms of really like how we pursue and how aggressively we like, notify the parents. And there were any changes from the drafts for the IEEs or the um, musical instruments? Minor. Okay. Uh, all right, thank you. Alyssa? Um, I had the opportunity to go to the Music in Our Schools show on, was it Thursday night? Um, my daughter was singing in the chorus with the sixth graders. The, the night was awesome. It was a one hour show um, district wide and it was really an excellent night. And I was struck by the number of parents who got up and left before the show had ended. Um, the auditorium was at capacity, I believe, when the show started. But by the time the high school chorus took the stage, there were probably half as many people in the auditorium. So I just want to speak to parents. Um, stay for the show and see where your kids' hard work in chorus in the younger grades um, pays off when they get to high school because the high school performance was so exciting and fun. So um, it's been on my mind since Thursday how many people got up and left like while kids were performing and it kind of bummed me out. So that's, that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Mike? Well, thank you. I know I've seen, I remember years past where uh, an announcement or request was made at the beginning to, to the request for people to recognize the accomplishments of the wall and stay. Um, so I don't know if they do that. There was, <coughs> there was an announcement made about halfway through, but it didn't stop people from leaving. I mean, I get that people have busy lives and everyone's got a job to go to tomorrow, maybe, or you know, kids at home. But um, it's only an hour of your night, of your time. So stay and watch. It's worth it. Okay. Um, I do appreciate the. The three-year planning, at least, we're looking well, you know, beyond next year, and um, and so that's that's visible, and I uh, look forward to seeing it in the other presentations. So, you know, that along with the strategic planning will help us, you know, uh, see further out, be able to plan and you know, meet our objectives that we want to achieve. So that's really good to see. Um, on the agenda tonight for the capital project, you'll see. The proposal for the, uh, the the artificial turf uh, field. So this is separate, and we mentioned it last time. This is separate from the prior approvals because the prior approvals were the, the the contracts for doing all the other work, where the 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 turf field and, and then where you could expound if, if I get it incorrect. But this is already you know um, they're a vendor that's already been uh, vetted and, and and lowest bidder on the state level, right? Yes. So. So that way, we you know we have the option to say here's fixed pricing to do this if if we want. So, so that's why uh, this is different than the others, and uh, this represents what the um, you know the cost of the uh, options that we've you know selected will be. So that's exciting to see that after we get approval here, we're setting ourselves up for a start whenever whenever the ground firms up. Um, Anthony had a meeting with the construction manager and the architect, and if all goes well, they're going to start April 1st. Um, but if it, it, it depends on the condition of the ground. But we're right. hoping for dry, if it stops raining, make it start. So it's uh, very exciting. Um, facilities and Operations Committee is this Wednesday, the 13th. So the time, is it going to be at 8.30 now? Or is it going to still be at 7 o'clock? Right after. Special board I mean, meeting. We were, I was guessing eight. Okay. It could so be we'll, before eight. So we're, you know, so we're, we're assuming eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, eight o'clock in the administrative office, district office. Yeah. So, and that's all for me. Thank you. All right. Anthony? Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for uh, putting up with my video here. Um, so we had a diversity committee meeting on uh, February 26th and um, 
we uh, also got a preview of the equity report card um, and my question is I guess um, you know it's not it's not necessarily doesn't necessitate a vote but can um, am I am I now free to make that link public or do I have to wait for something we're and and see um, I was gonna send it out at the end of the week uh, to the district and after I do that feel free to send it to your email list okay okay and then thank you and then at the diversity committee we also talked about um, uh, what's in our history books and Eric had offered to provide a list of the history and social studies textbooks that um, to the board that we use in the district um, and that uh, the uh, code of conduct review will also involve students um, in commenting on it so that would that's also a plus um, that our next meeting just uh, as James had said is uh, next Thursday the 21st at 8 15 uh, that's the end of my report. All right, thank you. Uh, I just, um, we, uh, the Technology Committee will be meeting for the first time on uh, March 20th at 4 p.m. at the Beacon High School Community Room. And I will, there's no agenda as of yet, so it was, if it, um, I'll share it with the board and <coughs> prior to the meeting. Um, just kind of a request, especially as we go into, as we're just kind of beginning budget season, I feel like maybe um, maybe we should have like a regular report from the from transportation through facilities or something because it seems like there's a lot of information to share on an ongoing basis in the sort of once a year around the budget um, is doesn't feel like it's sufficient because it's sort of gets in the way of really focusing on like, what do we need, how much do we need, and why do we need it? And there does seem like a great deal of detail um, to, to come through, and that Mr. Mackey does want to share. So I don't know, what do you think about that, Mike, of, of having, not necessarily having him come present, but maybe send a report through Anne Marie about relevant, like the A19 regulation that we're going to have to consider, just some sort of running mm -hmm. update so that, um, so that then this is more focused on budget. Well, certainly any, I would think any of the facility related issues, like we talked about the underground storage tank mm -hmm. or some of the other, the doors, the generator, um, that, that I would be looking to Anthony D'Amato to be you know, championing those type of facilities, especially as we put the 2022 capital plan together and are already added in the, the underground storage tank. So, right. so facilities related pieces, I would look at through Anthony. Um, as far as operational issues, I'm not sure if the operational, the training, and all that is really under facilities. Yeah. Figuring out really to, to, to be able to uh, uh, contribute to that. It's just a lot. I mean, I read through the report ahead of time, and it's just a tremendous amount. And I and it, there, it's obviously there are a lot of issues affecting that, and it is very important. And these are people that are interacting with our kids and doing important work. And there's things. I think that there's something really important that we discovered tonight through the um, Every Student Succeeds Act that relates to our community, that it's just hearing that right at this time of year where we're just kind of in this, you know, um, hearing that there are this many students that are captured under displacement is, is um, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that I feel like we would want to focus on, but I feel like it, it won't even, we won't even really be able to think about that until after we get through putting together a budget. and so. Um, if there's some other way we can weave this in, whether um, in a more ongoing way, that would be great. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Yeah, other than what uh, Mr. Rakowski explained about the point that <clears throat> Mrs. Flynn raised, I think the one thing that struck me from that presentation where we might want to take a further look is how are we attractive enough in our recruiting posture in this in this area. Uh, Mr. Mackey did mention uh, some concern about the benefits being of interest to people who left for other positions. So perhaps the administration <coughs> could take a look at that and maybe talk with our attorneys who work with us on uh, the personnel side to see whether uh, we're far off the mark there or on the mark or close to it or what. I'd like to hear a little more about that, learn a little more about our posture 
competitively. And we're, we're also, we sometimes forget this, but we're not just in competition with the rest of Dutchess County, but the whole Hudson Valley, because it's pretty easy for people to go to the neighboring district, and uh, including places to the south of us. So that was a point, I think, to take home from that presentation. If I can add to that, I mean, I'd also be interested in seeing how um, our uh, salaries and benefits packages compared to other occupations that require a CDL license where you wouldn't be responsible for children. I mean, like FedEx or UPS or are these people, or, you know, are we, if jobs are being created outside of uh, school district, we might actually be competing with the private sector as well. Can you capture that data? Or is that something Ron would know anecdotally? Um, I can try and see where that information is. Normally we just compare ourselves to other districts. We don't normally go outside of that. Um, but I can see what I can. Um, he might know if somebody mm -hmm. leaves, if somebody's resigned and taking a job. job then he makes that it probably wouldn't be like robots, but it would be good to know. Yeah. Okay. I know also that some people who are trying to hire commercial driver licensed people for things like the moving companies find it is challenging to fill their positions. They put a lot of brain energy and expense into trying to recruit for some of those positions. So it may be bigger than a bread box. <laughs> but uh, to move on, um, the, uh, the Wednesday meeting night is a little more complicated than usual. So I think we'll have to be kind of flexible about timing because uh, we also have the uh, public relations advocacy and legislative session. I don't have a lot to go over at that uh, meeting. The pot is still bubbling in Albany. But anyway, um, we should figure on still meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, there was one thing, sorry, that... Um, I, I, I'll yeah. bring it up. You'll bring it up? Okay, good, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we had the fitness fun night, and it was a success. It was well attended by all grade levels that were involved. Um, and there was some uh, mentoring between the older students and the younger students, which um, made it a really special event. So at the next board meeting, we want to put together a list of folks that we'd like to recognize for the success of the event and sort of um, show appreciation formally for that. And then coming up April 11th, we have the Beacon High School Wellness and College Fair. That'll be 6 to 8 p.m. here at the high school. And I'd just like to thank Wellness Event Chairperson Diane Tansy for her work on that. She's, she's really been working hard to put that together. Um, one thing I would like to mention that we're working on in the Wellness Committee is an initiative to promote and educate families about the district's wellness policy. So we want to um, get some, some interest and excitement around um, those policies and how they're connected to the schools and also try and tie them to any community resources that might be available that are related to issues covered in those policies. Um, so thank you to Celia and to Lori Merhij who have been helping me work on that. Um, our next wellness meeting is on Wednesday, April the 3rd at 4 p.m. for child care, please come. And then just a, so a small um, semi-personal plug, uh, Get Lit Beacon, um, it's a local writing salon, uh, reading salon. We meet once a month. We are working with Beacon High School to donate small libraries to the three special education English classrooms. Um, and many thanks to Principal Soto and Assistant Principal Sims. They've been really um, great and open to this idea. and They've helped us collect uh, wish lists from the teachers. We have a really great uh, list of um, books from a diverse group of authors, and we will be donating those to the school in May, which is uh, Get Caught Reading Month. And anyone can donate money um, to this. If you want to go to getlitbeacon.com, we would love for um, anyone to participate in, in donating. And I'd also like to thank uh, Julie Chavarro for, um, she's a founder, and for her um, having this idea and taking the initiative. So that's all. Great. Well, I just want to say I went to the fitness night and it was super fun and I forgot to bring it up and I apologize because it was a while ago. But the thing that was really cool this year was the kind of focus on the whole family. Like it wasn't just about kids, it was definitely, yeah. there were resources there for everybody. And so like the gym was great because there was the mentoring. You could 
have your kids go in and they would play and then you could kind of go around the side and there were really interesting exhibitors and it was like environmental health and personal wellness and it was really cool. Oh, good, good, yeah. They did a good job of pulling it together. Um, I attended the curriculum committee meeting last week and um, Principal Soto was there reporting back about her field trip with, a, um, with our computer science teacher to Hyde Park to learn more about Project Lead the Way, which um, is going to start at the high school in the fall. The, uh, they were really excited about it and um, I guess the teacher needs to go through a two week intensive professional development training but then we're good to go. So that's, that is um, great news for the fall. Um, the math department is looking at, kind of looking through different vendors to see about, mostly through software, how to enhance the um, math curriculum, looking for benchmarking, as well as just help for students. Um, actually, they were talking about this one program called ST Math, which sounded kind of amazing because it, it doesn't use any words, and so it sort of bypasses other issues that students might be having um, and gets straight to math. So it looked like they had found some really interesting options there. I'm excited to hear more about that. Um, we also talked about um, programs that are going to be added at the high school. So the original idea of adding Mandarin as a sec second language um, in the district is for now put to bed. I guess we, we didn't have any um, we had, people, we had applicants, but no certified teachers apply. And so um, for now, what we're going to do, because I think it is a really important, I, mean, I think the district thinks it's really important to add a second language since we have so many Spanish-speaking students um, in our district and giving them an option other than Spanish. We have a teacher that is a qualified Italian <coughs> teacher. Um, and so this will be no cost to the district in terms of staffing. I'm sure there will be a small cost to do with textbooks and things like that. Um, another program, new program at the high school that we talked about is a science program that's actually going to be um, really like the entire high school career of a student. They start in ninth grade um, and take a sort of a survey course about research and then if they decide to continue um, they end up doing basically like a three-year internship with a, a professional in the field of science through this, is it through Su a particular SUNY college or is it just SUNY in general? I can't uh, SUNY Albany. SUNY Albany. Um, this is through a new teacher we have at high school and it sounded really exciting. Sounds like other science teachers are jealous and excited as well and want to participate. So I think that will um, grow quickly. And then the last um, new course that we're adding so far is um, language and composition as an AP class. So that was great. Um, and then just quickly, I went to the Dutchess County School Board Association meeting on Thursday. Uh, Caroline Bobick from NISVA was there and kind of went over the governor's proposal as it stands right now. We are, I think in the next week or 10 days, we'll probably have um, the counter proposals, especially because the legislators um, raise is dependent on an on-time budget. So we can look for what the responses are there. But one of the things that was pretty alarming to me was this um, consolidation of services aid. So it looks like I, we can go through it more in the, um, in the meeting on Wednesday, but I think we should definitely write a letter of resolution. There's, um, I don't know if anyone saw it today, but there's a letter from um, Ron Mackey's union. Was it his union? I think his union. Um, talking about how it would really impair their ability to keep um, to keep the transportation um, services up as they need to be. Uh, the other thing is that March 23rd, there's a prospective board member workshop sponsored by the Dutchess County School Board Association. So if anyone is interested, they should contact Kelly Apology for more information. Um, the, uh, and oh, two more things. The, um, the Dutchess County School Board Association was asking if our board has a legislative liaison. We don't, um, so we, maybe we can talk about that on Wednesday as well. As well. Um, and then the last thing is, and this is very exciting to me, that they've decided that um, we're talking about themes for meetings next year, and the entire year is going to be focused on sustainability. So I think that'll be really great. We'll have 
you know, all the districts in Dutchess County talking about what they're doing, what their challenges are. We had speakers um, to learn more, so keep you posted on that. Great, thank you. Um, the only board comment I have is, is this our first special board meeting as this board? Have we had one before? So, mm -hmm. I think it, I just want to go over the procedure for it. So it will be posted, it will be Wednesday night at seven o'clock. We open up, we say the pledge, <coughs> we do roll call, and then we adjourn to executive session. The executive session is going to be to seek legal advice, and the le legal advice is as to in uh, June, we agreed upon an MOU with the county um, how to proceed or to extend it for, for the stadium aspects. So that is to seek legal advice about procedures as to how to go forward with that piece because that was only for a year. So this is really to talk about the procedures going forward as to what are the next steps and so forth. So that's what it's for. And that'll be here. Uh, that will be at the board office. Oh, okay. At the board office in the room where the committee meetings are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. That would have been an important piece. <laughs> it is important piece. All right. So I need a motion to adopt the resolution for the school buses, and this is a roll call vote. So I need the motion first. Motion to adopt the bond resolution for school buses. There a second. Second. Comments or questions? Um, I think my, um, again, I certainly have comments on it. Well, I was happy to see that uh, I was really looking at the real needs and, and you know, proposed only two buses this year, but, but it makes sense to have some more of the van style, especially with all the different you know, areas we're going to, so that really made sense to me. Um, in, the, in the file attachment, it, it, you know, the amount the proposition says it's four hundred fifty thousand yes. dollars, but in the in the attachment that is a public attachment, it, the the cover letter talks about four hundred thousand dollars. So we were going back and forth a little bit, so I'll correct that on the four hundred. So I changed the numbers <coughs> to four fifty. Actually, it was a maximum of four fifty. Once we know what the total will be, that's what we will put on on the proposition, and we will only borrow what we need. So it's no more than four fifty. But I'll change that portion. Right, I just want consistency. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Sure. Thank you. That's all I'm promise. All right. Roll call, Kelly. Ms. Better bid. We just say aye. Aye. Or yay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a personal style. Right? Whatever. <laughs> aye, yay. Mr. Case Leal. Aye. Ms. Flynn. Aye. Mr. Rakowski. Yes. Ms. Stadler. Aye. Never. Mr. Singh. <laughs> Anthony, did we lose him again? Anthony? He was sleeping. Anthony? Yes. Yes. He said yes. Oh, yes. Mr. Wolf? Yes. Ms. Hewer? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. Zero. All right. Moving on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate and the item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all board members to be heard on any issues. Is there anything from the consent agenda that any board members like to hold? 13.09. 13.09, Hearing no other items, I'm seeking a motion to approve agenda items 13.02 <coughs> through 13.14 minus 13.09, 13.04B, and 13.08. So moved. Second. <laughs> Comments or questions? I would just like to say with thanks for 13.07. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried 9-0. I need a motion for 13.09. So moved. I just wanted to um, close out to comment um, with um, just thanks to uh, Athletic Director Giammetta for um, looking out for opportunities and ways to expand our offerings. And the thing I like about this approach is that 
It doesn't require us making an upfront investment. It allows us to both expand a program that we have, but and then also explore something and interest and and build a program without necessarily, you know, um, making an upfront uh, investment, which I, I really appreciate. I think it's something that um, I, I'm grateful to him that he looked for this and that we have the option of having crew and expanding our um, swimming program. So I just wanted to flag that. Great. Any other comments? I think it's worth noting that uh, Spec and Co doesn't have a pool. So that gives rise to why they would want to collaborate with us. I think it's very uh, commendable that we're looking at other districts for these opportunities. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried 9-0. All right, I need a motion for 13.04B. So moved. Second. Comments or questions? Uh, my, my question is just a, a clarification. Under the salary, it just says $100, but um, it doesn't say, you know, per. per right. So I we, assume it's per day. It's per day, right. And we'll just make sure that it's clear on the next one. Okay. So. Just wanted the record mm -hmm. to be clear. Yep. So that's my only question. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried 9 0. I need a motion for 13.08. So moved. Second. Second. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, I think I'd seen this maybe it was in an email or a previous update where the talk group had been a change in the budget that was going to allow for um, maybe the space to include lighting and something like temporary bleachers. Is that what I'm seeing here, or is that? This is include the lights. Mm -hmm. um, the bleachers we are putting into the general fund, so um, Anthony has some ideas of some tow behind bleachers for now. Mm -hmm. um, the concrete pad will be part of the field, so the bleachers won't be on the grass, they'll be on the concrete field. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Giametta said that once we are able to do a full press box and bleachers at that stadium, we can use those bleachers anywhere because we need them in the baseball field, the softball field, Rombout needs them as well. Okay. So then it's not like it's a waste of money. We need that's them that's for kind of my question mm -hmm. is we're buying something. Right, so you won't see the bleachers in here because that's going to be a general fund expenditure, but the lights are in here. And we, we talked about it at the facility is that the reason why we opted to do um, the lights at this point was that it created more opportunities for expanded offerings and mm -hmm. expanded experiences and that the bleachers, yeah, would be something that could be repurposed and that this would allow, if we're investing in this field, this now allows us to get more use out of it immediately. So, because um, I wasn't part of the, the initial vote to approve the, the project, which at the time did not include lights, is that correct? It included the, um, it was always gonna include the bases and the infrastructure for the lights because when you put it in, you put the footings in for them. So, I don't know the right okay. terms for it, but mm -hmm. you set it up so that, so it, it was always with the plan of having the lights down the road it was whether we would offer it in this and I think originally you guys can correct me if I'm wrong the the reason why we were focused on bleachers and press box is because we were when we first started the discussion for the capital project we were going to rehab Hammond Field and that was part of what we were going to invest in and then that line of item kind of stayed but then when we started to look at this whole project that we were that we then um, decided to do we focused on light the decision for lights was not because of the, a change in pricing or, no. or like a surplus in the budget. That was my, my impression was that maybe things were underbid or over, there was some discrepancy in our bidding process, the way this was framed earlier. Some of the, um, I, and if you're referring to some of the memo that I wrote, um, yeah. all bids had come up higher than anticipated just because of that's the market. The lights was a concession that we were hoping um, that we could include, and we, we can mm -hmm. um, through another avenue, but it was, you're correct, we were gonna put in the basis for the lights. Um, but as the community got much more involved in the voting process, there was a huge interest in not only our sports using the field, but also the community sports, because the fields are a commodity here in Beacon. So to use that and, and let the community use it, the lights would be an easier way to do that. And I think it was also informed by the um, having the homecoming for the yeah, first time. Yeah. That yeah. experience was, um, awesome. and that was uh, Mrs. Soto 
kind of, and Mr. Giamatto worked together to kind of create that event, and they rented lights, and I think just the whole activity, like they had a couple of games in a row, and then they had a dance that night, and they were just like, this was such a nice event, and wouldn't it be great to actually get the lights in earlier? So that's why we started to re-examine everything, was it was really looking at it more as like a complete campus student life kind of experience, and then went how the community would access it, um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's. I'm glad you're asking these questions because those were the questions that I asked in facilities and knew that, as a member, you know that that's those are the things that people will bring up to you as a member of the public. Like, why did it change? And and especially if you don't have kids in the high school, you wouldn't know that that experience was really something that they saw as something they wanted to do going forward. And I guess the lights was a huge hassle, whereas they feel like renting the bleachers won't be as big a deal as renting those lights. And how long would the bleachers that we are, are getting, how long will those um, be functional, or usable? I think for a very long time, because they're, right. like, they're like a full structure. Like almost like you see, um, you know if you go to like Little League Fields or something, those bleachers that are next to the field, that's what I think they're going to be like, right? So we, we don't necessarily, we're not in a position where we have to, to get the, the, full the, the full set of bleachers next time around. If we See how it goes, right? Let's, let's see what it's like with the with the temporary bleachers. You know? mm -hmm. I think the goal is to actually put them in and make something sort of more complete. But I don't think that it's to that won't be the same level of expense as this field. Right. You know, this right. is the big investment, and then everything is sort of adding on to that whole, like leveling off that whole area, making it available for a field. Um, and the goal was really to make this kind of complete campus here because kids do kind of drift off and even with the event at Hammond it's like they really liked that but it was still you're walking away from the school it didn't kind of create this more um, encapsulated student life kind of experience but the yeah it wouldn't be as expensive I I, I don't know if I don't want to put words in your mouth but I'm, I'm wondering if you're thinking like this would be taking away from doing other things like Maybe. yeah and so I understand that I think that we would the goal the way this project was developed, and a lot of it happened, um, we were doing, Matt had been hired, but he wasn't here yet, so facil on facilities we were really taking a lot of care and making sure that it reflected updating the buildings in the way that we needed, but then also um, building on something that the public would really want and support. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it also came down to who, which leadership advocated and had kind of a vision for their school, sure. and in this particular round, Brian Soltish had some very clear ideas about how he wanted the capital project well, yeah. used. No, I, bring this it up. Is, this I is love up. the I love the idea of us having top rate athletic facilities, of course. Like that's absolutely. But you know, my understanding was that this this big chunk, this one and a half million dollars, was going to, to kind of get us there. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we have a lot of other things I'm thinking and Noah really enjoyed a little a few meetings back brought up, I think specifically they were like, we all love the, the fields, but we also want more A P classes. You know, there's other things that students are interested in. You know, there's many capital improvements we can make, language labs, tech services. You know, there's lots of things that will make a community stronger. So I just wanted to make sure that we're not putting ourselves on the hook so that we're like, well, we're buying temporary stuff solutions now oh, so that next time around we're on the hook to we're like, well, we, de we definitely need to, to fix that because we bought something that was temporary. No, you know, so they, I think that they would be repurposed, yeah, but right. I, the, I'm well, sorry we, if I was taking too long, but what I was no. going to finish and say was that Mrs. Soto hadn't been in place yet, Sure. and so now that she's here, I think that we'll have the opportunity to hear what her vision is for the high school, mm -hmm. and I'm sure, it will, I mean, my expectation based on what we've seen is that she'll bring a much more global right. Focus. But, but your point, um, and I'll because I've been making a pitch for this all along. Yeah. So 2022 is the next big is the next big capital project. So the, we need to look at our curriculum and what we want and what we need our facilities to be. Whether it's for sustainability, if we need dishwashers or right. or renovations, and that's what we need to be looking okay. at. And that's three years away. So actually, with the fall yeah. of 2020 <laughs> yeah. is when we have to start looking at going for a vote on it. So. Right. So that's, there, that's the avenue that's open for it. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. You think that way so we can get it on the list and then get it into the plan for 2022. I think at our last uh, facilities meeting, it really came down to trying to put the, the money together. And it was uh, 
uh, a couple of things. One is we realized it was sort of a, a contest between uh, bleachers or lights. And the thing about lights is that you, you have to do the underground infrastructure and the feeds and the conduits. And so why not do the whole thing and then you have them? And we, we, we have rented lights, but there's, there's a big difference. The, the lights that are rented are construction lights that are maybe 15, 20 feet off the ground. That's the wrong height. The ones we're getting are much higher so that they're not hitting, I mean, I went to the homecoming game and I was doing this all the time. Yeah. You know, I, was like, I needed a baseball cap, but I didn't have one. And uh, with highlights, you see the stuff on the field very well and it doesn't get in your way. So uh, I think Anthony uh, D'Amato was uh, looking up options for running bleachers as we talked <laughs> and, and they're out there. So that became a feasible thing which in the long run looked like a better way to do. The other thing is the, the bleachers can come out of operating funds, whereas our capital funds, because of the bond issue that was authorized by the voters, has a certain limit. So we're trying to stay under that limit. And uh, Mrs. Corderoni could probably explain a little bit more about how we came up with some additional capabilities there after looking at our fund balance and, and so on, if you want. Um. I can briefly talk about it. We are going to talk about it a couple of times after that in the budget process because it will be a proposition that's going to go to the voters. Um, so we were able to utilize, um, we had money sitting in a capital capital fund. It was approved by the voters in, as part of the general fund budget for the last two budget years. Um, so we are able to use the 500000 We were also going to use 200000 of an unappropriated fund balance in the general fund. Why the voters need to approve it only is because um, we didn't designate any of that money towards this capital project. We want to get the building aid on the total amount. So um, with the budget and the bus proposition, there will be a proposition. Um, what I will stress is that it will cost the taxpayers no additional money because it's money we already have. Um, and it will not affect the bonds that we have to, um, we have to float to pay for the project. So those are two great things. So we were able to utilize this money that we had put away already, and we were able to do this. So um, again, I'll talk about it a couple times so people in the community are familiar with it when uh, they go to vote. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried 9-0. Need a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Comments or questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, 9-0, 105.